Thank you very much. And let me join the other speakers in thanking Paul and the society for inviting me in to present here. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit away from muscle and heart and talk a little bit about the connective tissue in this case here. And uh, evidently the crucial thing with exercise and the adaptation occurs, of course, whether you do strength or endurance exercise in the muscle. But it's also well accepted that in order to make the move and come through, you need some of the connective tissues illustrated here, whether it be inside the muscle myotendinous junction, the tendon, the bone, the cartilage, or the ligament. And I'm going to take the tendon as an example to look a little bit uh, regarding what changes might occur in the tendon and when do things go wrong, uh, given the fact that for uh, people who do high-level exercise, uh, tendon overuse and painful tendons are one of the most frequent reasons for decrease in training and even stopping their career. So let's uh, take a quick look at the tendon as illustrated here, built up uh, predominantly by collagen type 1, as you know, and organized then in fibrils, which are then also interconnected by some crosslinks and organized in fascicles and then the whole tendon. If you look at it here with EM, you'll see in uniaxial aligned fibrils that go through the whole tendon here, probably from one end of the tendon to the other. You also will notice, if you look carefully at tendon pictures, that there is a relatively low cellular density here illustrated in an EM picture with uh, an elongated tendon cell, a fibroblast in this case. And then finally, for many years, the tendon has been subject to a lot of biomechanical analysis, uh, providing the fact that, or the, the belief at least, that the tissue was relatively inert and did not have any biochemical real activity or not major changes to uh, exercise or adaptation to that. So if you want to take a look at that, and let's start with the collagen, since it's a predominantly component of the tendon, and look at ways that we could address the issue. Similar to if you want to measure turnover of myofibrillar protein, you could also look at collagen in this way. And in animal studies for many years, people have used indirect methods to uh, look at different either mRNA or enzyme activity along the way from pro-collagen formation to the full collagen. And more lately, it's also been possible to look at other ways to address this uh, question. One way is uh, taken from the studies uh, in, in bone, where you measure the products that are cleaved off from pro-collagen in the conversion to collagen. And if you can get close to the tendon you want to look at, for instance, by microdialysis, you can do that. Another way is using the stable isotope technique that Phil was explaining the other day. And here you obviously would very often use proline because it then will go into hydroxyproline, which is a, 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 an important component of the collagen. And finally, you can also use C14 to determine the synthesis or the turnover rate in the tissue. And similar to when we discuss uh, uh, muscle, uh, we also had a much poorer grip on the degradation measurement. You can indirectly, of course, look at collagenases or gelatinases to indirectly say how much breakdown there would be or measure some fragments uh, or even uh, use deuterium method here to use that, but they're not very accurate in terms of this uh, study. So let's start with the C14 method. If we uh, take, and it was alluded to in one of the other presentations the other day, that if you during the period where there was uh, unfortunately a lot of uh, nuclear bomb trials, uh, we saw that there was an elevation in the atmospheric content of the C14. Now, after they were banned in 1962-63, then gradually we're coming back to the level of that was uh, present before. So if you, for instance, are born in 1963 and you have some tissue for instance, the islands, which will not be exchanged through the whole life, and you had the possibility of taking a sample out, let's say around year 2000 or wherever, then it would still contain the C14 content that it had when it was, so to speak, made. Whereas in other tissues, it could be the muscle or the liver, or things that have a higher turnover, you would expect the C14 content at the year of 2000 to be the same as would be uh, the case in the atmosphere. And if we look at tendon, and you have it over here, you can see it's neither nor. Uh, here we have samples from, these are autopsy samples, there are also some biopsy, uh, muscle biopsies, which are ex exactly on the line of year 2000, where uh, the, the tissue was sampled. Whereas the tendon measurements are uh, not on this line, they're not on this line either. 
if you do a calculation where you take away the whole growth period, so you basically take away 0 to 17, 18 years of age, then you will see that there's a much better fit. Uh, basically telling us that there is a turnover of collagen in the tendon uh, before uh, you are, uh, while you're growing, or before you're 17, 18 years of age, and after that, the major components in the tendons are not very much changed. So the idea of uh, the tissue being very inert, so to speak, fits in this case here, and the uh, uh, mission could be accomplished here. But there are some uh, discussion then regarding other findings, and if you look at uh, acute exercise and try to look at uh, the turnover things in with uh, either the microdialysis technique, not through the tendon, but in the close proximity to the tendon, or you use the stable isotope technique and one-legged knee extension model for an hour here, and then look at the responses to exercise, you will see that there is some change, not that dramatic, but there is some significant increases in the fractional synthesis rate, and likewise also in the cleavage products from pro-collagen. So, whereas I just showed you that not a lot is happening in the whole tendon, this indicates that there are some dynamics in the collagen synthesis uh, and maybe also in the degradation, but at least in the synthesis. If you do some calculations, you could actually come up with the point that even if only, only 90 or 95 percent of the tendon was not turning over, you could still get uh, pictures like that. And the uh, belie current belief is that you have a large portion of the tendon which is not changing after your after your growth, but there is a smaller portion, and we don't know exactly where that is, whether it's in between the fascicles or elsewhere, that is actually turned over and respond to uh, physical activity. And if you take data also from the degradation part, although they're not as strong as the synthesis part, you get a picture where you, after acute exercise, and this is just very schematically drawn here, get a situation where you have increased synthesis, you have increased degradation, and therefore, uh, in some way, you're challenging your balance, and after some time, it flattens out after one bout of acute exercise. So it could be hypothesized that overuse injury, though not proven yet, uh, could be an effect of too much training too quickly, where the homeostasis is not established, established again. So, if I say there's not much going on in the tendon, does that mean that if you train, you won't get any morphological adaptation in the tendon? Well, you should think so. But if you take cross-sectional data first of runners, you can show that they have thicker tendons, this is Achilles tendon, than matched, weight-matched sedentary controls. Further, if you take Achilles tendon in runners and volleyball players, and here, this is the cross-section area with MRI from the calcaneic insertion and all the way up uh, further up the leg, then you can see that uh, runners and uh, jumpers uh, have a higher cross-section area compared to sedentary controls, but also to high-level kayak rowers who don't use their legs so much. But clearly, these data could be simply a, a phenomenon of cross-sectional studies. They could just be a, a question of you, that you only will succeed in these sports if you have a big attendant. A little more close to the argument that there is a training effect of this is the uh, data from uh, people who do uh, exercises where one leg would be more dominating, for instance, in fencing and, and badminton, where you see that you can find differences between the strength of the quadriceps and in the, the two legs of the same individuals. And you can see that accompanying this difference, you also in two out of three sites along the patella tendon can find that the leg which is stronger also has a little bit thicker tendon than on the other side. These individuals have trained since they were very small, and it's most likely that a lot of these changes must have occurred very early, because we've done several studies now of training up to a year where we see absolutely no change in the cross-section area of the tendon. So, so much for the cross-section area and the collagen turnover, but there's probably more to the story, because it's not only a question of the size of the uh, tendon, it's also a question of its mechanical behavior. And I think without going into too much detail of it, it's important to uh, acknowledge that there are also other proteins that might come into play here. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that there are possibility of cross-linking, especially enzymatic cross-links, which are driven by the enzyme lysyl oxidase. 
And one proof that this is an important issue in, in making a tendon or developing a tendon is here, where this is an in vitro study where human tendon cells are allowed to form an artificial tendon, so to speak, and we measure then the collagen content throughout this development. And if you block the lysyl oxidase, which is a blocker of the enzymatic crosslink in that structure, you don't inhibit the formation of collagen. So the tendon will be equally thick, but the point here is pretty clear that the uh, modulus or the stiffness of the tendon is, uh, uh, is very much diminished <coughs> when you have given this blocker of the cross, uh, cross uh, links in the tendon. So it's not just a question of, of size. Size matters in terms of resistance to the loading, but it's also a question of the stiffness within the tendon. So what about humans? Um, we, if you want to train and you want to influence your tendon, it's not going to be so much in the cross-section area, but it's maybe going to be in the stiffness of the tendon. And here is, some is a study from a, a, a group from Berlin where they have uh, subjected people to 14 weeks of training uh, four times a week, post, uh, pre and post exercise means pre and post training, and they looked at the stiffness of the tendon by a, a load deformation or stress strain curve where they see how stiff the tendon is when they uh, do a contraction with the calf muscle. And you can see that if they do the training with 55% of MVC, this is isometric, they ach uh, achieve some kind of strain of the tendon, but they don't see any increased stiffness. Whereas if they go up to a 90% of MVC, again, a, three, a, a protocol where they had three seconds of contraction, three seconds of relaxation, then there was an improved stiffness. And a lot of studies around the world would show that training is associated with increased stiffness of the tendon. If we then ask the question, how important is mechanical loading for the tendon to function as it should? Then again, this is uh, what I just showed you a glimpse of before. If you seed out uh, human fibroblasts uh, on a fibrin gel and you put basically pins in, you don't have to do anything more than that, then spontaneously after 14 days you will form an artificial tendon. It's not uh, as strong as a normal tendon, it's only one tenth of the strength, but the structure is uh, very similar, although there are more cells than in a normal tendon. And if you then do this, it's illustrated up here, and you can stimulate it in several ways, but ask the question, what if we cut this construct here? How does it behave? Does it continue to show phenotypically tendon signs uh, that this is what this experiment is all about? And if you f make a new tendon, the whole fibrogenesis is very dependent on some specific markers which are very tendon specific. In this case, scleraxis in the early phase and later on tenomodulin, which is, although it exists in other tissues as well, but it's very predominantly in uh, tendon and then of course uh, the uh, collagen. And if we look what happens, and we have the uh, value one here for the mRNA in the uh, tension, the normal construct formation situation, you can see that when the tendon construct is cut, you uh, immediately in the days after have a down regulation of tenomodulin and collagen type one, and it's also followed by a change in the protein content. And in the normal situation where you have tension and you add TGF-beta, which is a stimulator of collagen formation, you have a small but present effect, whereas in the case where there's no tension, you will not be able to rescue this situation by just adding TGF-beta. And this is at least uh, some indication in this model that if you, if you don't have mechanical loading, uh, it's going to be tricky for you to compensate by pharmacological agents in this situation. So you can say a detention construct not only uses sort of the phenotypical expression of being a tendon, but also uses, loses the tendon characteristics here illustrated as the fibrils cross-section area of the fibrils in an EM, and down here just after two days, it is not having this uniaxial orientation. This is a model where it only takes 14 days to make the tendon. So it's not like if you had been inactive for two days, these things will happen in humans, but it at least illustrates that mechanical loading is extremely important. And just further so, 
in sensing this tension in the, in the tendon cells, here is a fibroblast, we know that for mechanotransduction to occur, the integrins are extremely important. And in this model where you have detensioned or cut this construct, you can see that integrin alpha 11, which is very mechanical sensitive in uh, tendon tissue, is downregulated immediately. So it might be that <coughs> once you, you drop the tension of the, of the tendon, uh, then you're also uh, pretty bad off in terms of mechano uh, sensing. Is there any correlate in humans that there will be a change? I've said there is an increased stiffness with training, but is there also a correlate that there will be a, a more slack tendon if you immobilize? These are actually data from experiments here in Nottingham together with Manchester, where you can see that the tendon stiffness with just three weeks of immobilization is rapidly going downwards and talking to you about the tendon synthesis rate for collagen, you can see that uh, acute exercise elevated it a little bit and you can see you really get down to a very low value in this situation. So if you immobilize and you don't use the tendon in order to get better, you can be sure that a lot of the turnover that happens there is being going much slower. So tendinopathy, just to put that here at the end and talk a little bit about what, what is it and what is happening actually. Well, we all can agree that it means that the tendon has been loading and used this elastic function and uh, that there is pain in the tendon. This function, it's also painful to, um, uh, to palpate it, uh, but what does it look like when you look inside? Well, this is a piece of a human Achilles tendon, a healthy one, and this is a part of a tendon which is tendinopathic. And you can see here, appreciate that the elongation of the uh, cells in the tendon are changed. You have more rounded cells. And you can also see that there is an accumulation of glucosaminoglycans, which is mainly responsible for attracting the water and the swelling of the tendon. If we take it a little more in detail and do a 3D reconstruction of human tendon piece, in this case it's people with long-term Achilles tendinopathy where they have a biopsy taken from the deceased area and then another biopsy from the suspectably healthy part of the tendon, a little, a little a bit away from where the tendinopathic area is. You can see this is a, a reconstruction. These are cells and this is then a cross section of the fibrils in the Achilles tendon. There's a well, it's well organized, whereas if you look at the tendinopathic part, these, uh, the, the cells have not the direction as shown over here. And here you can see a fibroblast uh, from <clears throat> this reconstruction and the blue part here is actually the nucleus which is almost dragged out in this situation and in the other part you can see that there are much more what's called early around it but at least they show a pattern which looks like they're not loaded like they're unloading you'd get the same situation if you did that in uh, an animal study and uh, reload or deloaded the, the uh, tendon. Furthermore uh, whether you look at the protein content or you look at the mRNA in the diseased area or the tendinopathic area, you can see upregulation of several proteins of those I showed before, which are sort of helping proteins for the structure of the tendon. But it's a consistent finding that the uh, decorin protein, which is very mechanosensitive and which is very important for the function of the tendon normally goes down in this situation. Again, further supporting that what we have is actually an area which is not really uh, tensile loaded uh, in, the, uh, in the tendinopathic situation. So what's the treatment for tendinopathy? This is not going to be a talk about mechanism behind the treatment, but it's just to say that uh, these uh, models with eccentric slow contractions, in this case of the Achilles tendon, where you, when you have tendinopathy, but also regimens for patellar tendinopathy have by far beaten all other pharmacological treatments. And this is the preferred treatment, at least in the mid-substance uh, uh, of Achilles tendon and the insertional part of the patella tendon, developed in America and Sweden, and has been supported very well. And I mention this because in this study we have only compared these two things, so you have to believe me when I say this will beat most of the other regimens you can come up with. But more lately, there's been the debate whether it should be eccentric. That was a, at some point it was a magic word. Uh, if you were a physiotherapist, it had to be eccentric exercise. And the question is whether that was was really needed. And some of the newer data would show that whether you look at the pain score starting here and then following up first 12 weeks of intervention and following them up for almost uh, a year after, 
uh, you can see that the effect is exactly the same whether you do a regular concentric slow contractions or you do eccentric contraction as here. And this is a VISA score, which is a functional score of how well your tendon is functioning. The improvement is also the same. So today I have to say that it doesn't matter really whether you do eccentric or concentric contractions in this case for the outcome of this result. And why could that be? Um, and one piece of insight comes from uh, an animal study here where uh, concentric and eccentric contraction uh, was used uh, in uh, a hind limb of a rat. And you can see here that uh, since the work output or the force was, uh, that generated was higher in the eccentric contraction, you can see that the suppression of myostatin expression or the upregulation of IGF-1 was dependent on the magnitude of the load, and this is inside skeletal muscle. Whereas if you look at the tendon, and I've only taken one example here, but there's a lot of other uh, factors who show the same, will normally show exactly the same upregulation, di uh, disregarding whether you use concentric or eccentric contraction here. Another puzzling thing, at least to me, was that I've just shown that you get tendinopathy because you overload your tendon by doing exercise. So why is it so that exercise will then help as a regimen on that? And one of the insights from that, I think, again, comes from the, from the uh, group in Berlin who did what I just showed you before, these regimens of 90% MVC, uh, which caused a 6% strain of the tendon, three seconds on, three seconds off. And they showed that a 14 weeks of training program caused a stiffening of the tendon. They also tried for 12 seconds, it showed the same. But what they did then was they tried to do 96 jumps so that the area under the curve was approximately the same. And what they could show here was that there was absolutely no effect, and these are healthy individuals, on the stiffness development in the tendon. And that's probably because the viscoelastic components make sure that if you do very rapid contraction, you don't get the strain on the tendon. And therefore, maybe in a diseased state, you will not touch the area that is really tendinopathic, and this is really what gave you the thing in the first case. So uh, to end up here with the, uh, with the tendon pathogenesis, uh, we are not right, uh, quite there yet. The, in the old days, most people believed in the idea that it was a mechanical damage. It was a small partial rupture which just didn't heal properly, and it has unfortunately not been possible currently from any groups really to show that there is a mechanical uh, damage in there, even with good MRI techniques. So I'm not personally very favorable of this, but definitely it's out there. Uh, the other idea, which is uh, I don't think very many people believe in that anymore, is that the primary breakdown should come from the collagenasis and therefore is a starting of a breakdown. And the reason for this one becoming very popular is there's a very good animal model for it. So potentially that could mimic what's happening, but unfortunately it doesn't look like that's what's happening in humans. There are studies out there beginning more and more to show that there are genetic predispositions especially in collagen type 5 and other types of collagen, which will uh, not predict, but at least show uh, a higher frequency of uh, injury. And then there is no doubt, and I haven't spoken about that today, there's no doubt that, that the insertional parts where you get compressions, either from a shoe or in the shoulder, that there uh, is a change where collagen type 1 gradually is changed to collagen type 2 and therefore begins to look more than cartilage. No doubt about that. I will suggest but I don't have any uh, full proof for it that uh, a lot of what we see is a homeostasis perturbation, it's repeated overload, and that we actually don't tear any of the fibrils, but we accumulate disorganized tissue in between the fibrils or the fascicles, almost like if you had a piece of rope and you put a stone inside the middle of it, and that is really going to be uh, painful in this situation. And here you have two fascicles, and we know that there are a lot of things going on in here. We know there are some recent observations, they're not out in publication yet, uh, yet where, <coughs> where we've seen some circadian rhythm actually in the fragments of collagen lying around in there, uh, maybe supporting the idea that you need a, a, a period of recovery before you're ready again to do something. And it could easily be that an, an accumulation of disorganized tissue in here will really lead to the tendinopathic syndrome. 
And finally, uh, from <clears throat> the Screens Group in London, they're beginning to come up with some data, and these are so far on cow flex attendance, where they show that not all cells inside the tendon are equally active when subjected to strain, and could show that now in two papers that there is <clears throat> an idea about that the cells in between the fascicles are those who are actually more active when you are subjected to strain, and that would then fit with the location for tendinopathy. Uh, so, I think that fibril formation, collagen formation, uh, is occurring very early in life uh, while you're growing, childhood, adolescence. After that time, the main structures are stable. But then, with mechanical loading, we stimulate a small pool of collagen and crosslinks that can modify the mechanical properties. And I think, and there are some evidence for it now, that in between these fascicles, there are, uh, so to speak, daily workhorses, the fib uh, fibroblasts, who are really uh, making the normal turnover, whereas within the fibril uh, fascicles uh, there are a lot of dormant cells who will only become woken up if you get a tear, a full tear or partial tear of the, of the tendon in this case. So to conclude, tendon structure changes and adapt in size occurring early in age, which could emphasize why you should do training at an early stage if you want to use the tendon a lot later on, but there appears to be a very limited renewal of the main structures. Dynamic loading can stimulate collagen protein synthesis and degradation in a smaller pool in human tendons, potentially located be between fascicles, but that needs to be shown there. Activity and immobilization of human tendon is associated with relatively fast changes in tendon mechanical properties. You increase the stiffness or lose it. Lack of mechanical stimulation of tendon also has tendon phenotype in vitro and decreases tissue turnover and tendon stiffness in humans. Tendinopathy results in a rounding of cell and matrix disorganization and a controlled strength training either of eccentric or concentric nature has a beneficial effect upon tendinopathy. So in thanking my collaborators, I'll thank you for your attention. <laughs>